coaches and athletes have influence. And the never changing message within the Fellowship of Christian Athletes is the gospel of Jesus Christ, his love for humanity, and our responsibility to let others know about him. FCA is experiencing growth like we've never seen before. The influence that you're having on these kids and these athletes and coaches. And they're going to affect the community for generations. We're going to the ball fields. We're going to the courts. And that's what's so powerful about the FCA. We go to where the coaches and athletes are. And now more than ever, we desire fellowship. Because we are not designed to walk this life alone. It's about the impact you have on others' lives. But the influence, the ripple effect, it carries generations and generations. Today, we're in over a hundred countries with leaders around the world to bring life change. Now your FCA sports, coaches and athletes want to compete as FCA, competing in kindergarten all the way through their professional career. And whether you're an athlete, whether you're a coach, whether you're a fan, we are mobilizing volunteers and we are here to teach you, to train you and grow the body of Christ. But for them to effectively do what they do, they need the resources. So we create Bibles, resources, and training for coaches and athletes to become empowered leaders who move the mission forward. The team is growing to reach coaches and athletes transformed by Jesus Christ. No matter where they come from, no matter what they look like, uh, no matter what their background is, they're here with the sole purpose to lead every coach and athlete into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ and his church. And every means every. Every coach, every athlete, every sport, every country. The gospel is bearing fruit and spreading throughout the whole world. And we're just scratching the surface. We're called as disciples of Christ to make disciples. So that I can make disciples who are able to make other disciples. So now more than ever, as we look into the future, we see this desire, this passion, men and women, boys and girls, dedicated as a disciple to go make disciples. Since the very beginning, FCA has always been Jesus Christ, coaches and athletes. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. All right, welcome. Good evening. It's great to see everybody. Yes, absolutely. My name is Brian Hubbard, and I'd like to welcome you all here tonight. I serve uh, FCA Maryland uh, as, as chairman of our board, and uh, on behalf of our board and our staff and our volunteers and our friends, we are just so thankful, uh, just so glad to be out and just to see so many faces. So welcome. We're so glad you're here. And uh, as we start our night and start our program, uh, I've been a part of FCA for well over 30 years. I've sat in these seats. I've, I've been a student. I've been a coach. Uh, I've been a huddle attender. Um, I love FCA, and I'm so glad you're here. A couple of things before I transition is, number one, you're not here by accident. You were invited by somebody. You could have been invited here tonight because you invited somebody else to a dinner, and they're paying you back, Right? You are here because somebody influenced you and they invited you to be a part of this night. Some reason you are here, and I know God has a story and a reason uh, for you to be a part of this evening. So we are going to give you something here tonight. I, I can assure you of this. Number one, you are going to learn. You're going to learn about FCA and what's happening in the state of Maryland and across our world with FCA and FCA International. You're going to learn something new about FCA. Number two, I assure you that you will be inspired. There will be a story that will tug at your heart, something, someone will speak to you. And three, as all athletes, we all want to be a part of a team. I know there's tryouts going on right now at all local schools for spring sports, and every kid is dreaming of making that team. We're going to invite you tonight to join our team and be a part of FCA and all the great things that we're doing. 
So as we transition here, I serve alongside uh, the state director, Sean Smithson. Sean has been just an incredible friend, an incredible leader, and a mentor, and I'm so thankful that I've gotten to serve along Sean. Um, I guess about a year ago, maybe a little less than that, Sean came to me and, uh, and said that he has an opportunity to lead in a new role. He served, his talents do very, uh, fit very well in an alignment with uh, Director of Talent Advancement. And Sean is uh, moving and stepping into that role and going to lead many of our staff here in the Mid-Atlantic region, and even really nationally and internationally, his talents set so well with that. And so we, as we transition, um, we have a uh, director that is stepping up, and uh, Brandon Johnson, who we're so excited to announce is going to become our new state director. Beginning this June, he's already serving in the role, and he's done a great job, and he's been a great friend of mine. I'm honored that I get to serve alongside him as the uh, state board director. So I'm going to turn it over to Sean and I'll continue our evening. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. And thank you everyone for being here. Many of you were here five years ago when Mark handed me this very baton that in a few minutes I'll get to hand off. Uh, but before I do that, one of the things I'm so excited about is that when Mark handed me this baton, it wasn't because he was going to go get a beach house or, or golf all the time. Well, maybe he's going to golf all the time. <laughs> but he did have another mission that he was called to, and that's our international ministry. And he's been running in that lane as our regional director of international advancement in an incredible way. And tonight, it wouldn't make a lot of sense for us to start off this night without just sharing a little bit about how what's going on globally impacts the FCA family. So Mark, if you would share with us a little bit your role and then also what's going on globally. Thanks, Sean. Uh, they always say when you're in a leadership role, try to hire better than yourself. And I did that. So uh, Sean's done an amazing job and uh, it's just been a blessing to watch you serve. Well, in the fall of 1982, uh, when I was a sophomore at the Ivy League of the Eastern Shore, uh, Salisbury University, um, <laughs> That's where I got introduced to FCA. Had uh, been a long journey, and the last five years served in the international role. I'm the Mid-Atlantic International Coordinator, so our 235 staff um, in the Mid-Atlantic, I co coordinate all of their international efforts. Uh, specifically, our focus is getting people to pray and to give and to go. Our region is aligned with Southeast Asia, which is 11 countries. Um, there that we're connected with. We have two of our teammates uh, here tonight, uh, Joshua from Cambodia and Willie from Malaysia. They're both in the back at table 26 with me. It's too dark to see them, but uh, hopefully you come back and meet them. Thank you. Thank you. Both of them, the first time to America. So they just said I hadn't had a crab cake yet. And I'm like, what a failure I am. What a <laughs> failure. Tomorrow we're having crab cakes somewhere. Anybody got any good recommendations? Just kidding. I see, I know, I know that place. But uh, anyways, it's been great. FCA is in 105 different countries. And it's great to serve in Southeast Asia, 11, 11 countries there. Six out of the 11 of those countries are listed in the top 50 most persecuted uh, countries in the world. Tough go. Tough go for a lot of our guys there where it's illegal to share your faith in many of those countries. But I want to just transition real quick to really what Sean wanted me to share with you is uh, not a part of our region, but a part of our team and deeply in our hearts is our teammates in Ukraine. And we have 11 teammates that came to a conference last week and they're here with all of their families and 11 are still in the Ukraine. And uh, this past week at our international conference was an amazing moment. I think we have a slide of it. And, uh, and on this slide, uh, we blurred out their pictures just for safety reasons, but uh, the tall guy is our Ukraine national director, and the shorter guy is our um, Russia director. You got Ukraine and Russian teammates standing side by side, arm by arm, praying for each other in front of everybody and all of our teammates. So it's not all bad news, uh, but there is bad news, and so we need to keep our teammates uh, in prayer, and I'm just going to pray for them right now. Mm -hmm. Father, we just thank you for uh, this opportunity that we have to come and lift up our teammates. And uh, it was just heartbreaking to be with Andre and Lindsay at 10:30 at night, 
30 minutes after the bombing started. And they're seeing their own neighborhood just being obliterated. And what we could do and only we could do is just pray, God, be merciful. So, Lord, we pray uh, for our world. It's a crazy world out there. And, Lord, specifically, just want to lift up our teammates in, in Russia and in Ukraine. We love you, Lord. We're so grateful we can come to you with these requests in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I mentioned five years ago, Mark handed me this baton and gave me the incredible honor of coming alongside a team of what was around 40 staff at the time to lead the ministry of Maryland FCA. It's funny, I told Brandon not to hold this because he'd wave it around, so I'm <laughs> going to put it down for a minute. Incredible, incredible team that I've gotten to be a part of, and not only the staff, but our board that has grown to a large number, 22 board members serving on our state board, helping us to do what we do, inviting you to be a part of events like this and our golf event. Holding on to this baton has been an incredible privilege because I've had to run really fast and I've gotten to run alongside some incredible men and women on our board, donors, volunteers, coaches, and our staff. Over the five years, we've seen our staff grow to over 70 staff around the state. We saw our state board grow from six to over 20 board members around the state. We've had opportunities to impact all over Southeast Asia. I've had the opportunity personally to be able to go coach in, in Laos and train coaches to reach athletes with the gospel in a country that's not open to the gospel yet. I've also had the opportunity to go to Thailand and to go into Baltimore City. In the last five years, we built a townhome. We rebuilt a townhome in Baltimore City that's been used by FCA, by Young Life, by Grace Fellowship Church, by Grace Community Church, and most importantly, by the very own mayor of Park Heights, Garrick Williams, to serve coaches and athletes in that community. So much incredible work has been done, and it's been a huge blessing. Through that, and through Steve, who I see sitting up front here, Steve Sims is an incredible gift and a blessing to me, who's helped me to organize the leadership of this state. And through his guidance, we divided into seven multi-areas, and those seven multi-areas had leaders. And when it was time for me to pass the baton on, many of those leaders stepped up and said, I think I could carry it. And we had four incredible candidates that thought that God might be calling them and we thought God might be calling them. And we led a search committee and we walked through this process with probably the most incredible pool of candidates that we've ever seen. And what I loved about it most was the humility and the prayer that went into it for every candidate as they prayed for one another. And when it came time to pick the next state director and figure out who God was pointing at, we knew without any question that the guy standing next to me was going to take the lead. Two things I want to share tonight, and then I'll be done and give the floor to Brandon. Number one, this is the first time in our state's history that I know of where we have a state director and a state board chair that have both come to Christ through the ministry of FCA. Incredible, incredible blessing. I've always heard people say, you don't want to go on a tour with somebody who's never been to the place you're touring right? You always want to go with the tour guide that's been there before. How much better to have a local, right? Somebody that was born there. So these guys weren't born in FCA, but they were certainly born into a new relationship with Jesus in FCA. What a blessing. <laughs> Cannot wait to see what God does through you. The last thing I'll say is a few years, five years ago, six years ago, when I met Brandon, what stood out to me about Brandon is this. He reminded me of a saying from a general that I admired by the name of General Martin Dempsey. And General Dempsey, in front of about 500 kids who'd lost a loved one in the military, one kid said, sir, how do you get to be a four-star general? And General Dempsey, without skipping a beat, said, well, the first thing is you shouldn't want to be one. He said, in our nation's history, there's been a lot of men and women who wanted to be a four-star general. And history is not written very well of them. It's the men and women that do the job in front of them with excellence every day and accidentally end up becoming a four-star general that history writes well of. 
That's been Brandon since the day I met him. He doesn't seek promotion. He doesn't seek his own glory. He's in this to do his job with excellence and to serve the Lord. So Brandon, it is my honor to hand you the baton of leadership. Don't mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Brandon. Appreciate you. This is awesome. Sean, thank you so much. It's an honor. Um, a coach has you see what you don't want to see so you can be who you've always known you could be. That coach that said that was Tom Landry. Tom Landry had great success as an NFL coach. He's legendary. Um, he's in FCA's Hall of Champions. But what's most admirable about Coach Tom Landry is his assistant coaches and that what they went on to do when they became head coaches and the success that they had. Sean, God has used you to be my Tom Landry. Thank you so much for your investment in me, your mentoring me uh, beyond what I ever imagined. Thank you. Some more of your assistant coaches, your multi-area director team have some words. Um, so I'd like to direct our attention to the screens. Thank you, Sean, for leading so well over the past few years. I just want to say thank you for serving as the Maryland State Director. And I just want to take this time right now to, to thank Sean for just the uh, leadership that he's shown. It's funny, when you started, I wasn't too sure about you. You probably weren't too sure about me, but really have grown to love you as a friend, uh, love where your heart is spiritually, love how you led us, uh, love, love your heart for your family, and just loved you as the State Director. It's been a journey here in Baltimore. We've done this together, and through the glory of God and Coach Guard. Five years ago, I was a volunteer board member, and Sean led me onto staff as the multi-area director for Montgomery and Prince George's County. I've grown a ton in the past few years. Uh, a big reason for that is because of Sean's belief in me, his challenging me and encouraging me uh, to take the next steps uh, in my leadership. Because of your leadership, I have felt empowered to live in my giftings and pursue God's call on my life and be able to pursue collegiate ministry, not only at University of Maryland, but across the state. And just to see it grow is really a testimony to your encouragement and um, just your leading so well. Uh, we literally are trying to get Southern Maryland on the ground, uh, FCA, and build it up. I've been here three years and uh, we're just making remarkable progress. And a lot of that is because of your leadership and just what you've seen in me. Congratulations from Baltimore City Fellowship of Christian athletes. And good luck to you on the next phase of your journey. I look forward to what God does in and through you in the next uh, role that you have with FCA. Thank you so much for investing in me and all our staff across the state. Love you, man. Mm. Well, if it's not evident, I have big shoes to fill. Sean, you've done a phenomenal job and God's gonna continue to you, Sean, in our region to advance the talent through hiring, recruiting, and onboarding our staff throughout the region. Sean, thank you so much. And the next part of our program, Sean, I'd like to hand it over to you to do an award that is near and dear to your heart. So Sean. I love it. I just handed him the leadership and he's already given it back. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. Oh, this is great. This, um, Actually, I, I asked for the privilege to do this. A few years ago when I was up here, I, I wanted, I felt led by God to, to lead the implementation of an award that we would give away every year uh, for a coach or an athlete that's overcome a significant obstacle for God's glory. That even though life was not going the way they wanted or had planned, they said, it's okay because God's got this. So every year for the last four years, we've been able to give this award. We named it after a, a hero of mine who is here uh, by the name of O.J. Bergantz. So we're gonna play a little video uh, so that you can watch that. And then we will announce this year's O.J. Bergantz Courage Award winner. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I have been given the privilege of saying a few words to this year's recipient of the O.J. Briggs Courage Award. 
Back in 2007, we received a diagnosis that my wife and I were hardly prepared for. After a grueling diagnostic process, the doctors determined that I had ALS. Amyotropic lateral sclerosis is a motor neuron disease that robs you of all voluntary muscle movement until you are left virtually paralyzed. Chanda and I were devastated. After the tears dried up, God allowed revelation to come. Every one of our trials and tribulations we had experienced during our lives had prepared us for such a time as this. It takes courage to walk the walk that, that he's been given. It takes courage to walk that walk and to walk it in the way that he's walking and to walk it with um, the faith that he's he, he has. And so the faith um, combined with that courage just is amazing. When I think about OJ's example of faith and courage, I think back to one of the first conversations we had back in 2008, and he shared with me his feelings about the whole thing. And he said, this was an amazing opportunity. You know, and he talked about how his whole life, he had been such a strong person physically, how he loved working out. You know, that part of his life was really, really important to him and meant a lot and gave him a lot of joy and a lot of, a lot of happiness, you know. And he told me that he thought that God was taking something away that he valued greatly, something that really mattered to him in order that other things would become a bigger part of his life and a bigger focus. And I never forgot that because to me, that's what OJ has done. He's taken that circumstance uh, and made it something glorious and great for God. OJ didn't plan this, you know, he didn't plan for this part of his life to approach him this way, yet he embraced it. And I think about that verse in Jeremiah where it talks about, for I know the plans I have for you, plans not to harm you, but to give you a hope and a future. If we all look at OJ's diagnosis and what was ahead of him, we kind of wonder, could I go through that? Could I do that? And then you watch how OJ has depended on that, God's plans for him, right here. unwavering faith, unwavering courage. And you're in awe of his faith and courage, Use that for whatever you're going to face tomorrow. Just to see that type of strength and in a person such as OJ, it, it ministers to me, it ministers to others, and it allows, again, God to be seen. Greater is He who is within me than He that is in the world. When we encounter adversity in our lives, we have an important choice to make. We can either choose to react or choose to respond. You see, a reaction is a quick, emotional, instantaneous act stimulated by fear of our circumstances. But a response is a thoughtful, calculated intentional reply to a situation based on the truth. Truth such as Romans 8, 28 that says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. This evening, we honor someone who chose to respond to their adversity, not react to their circumstances. Tonight, we recognize and applaud your strength, courage and faithful perseverance. Congratulations on being named this year's recipient of the O.J. Briggs Courage Award. OJ, Shanda, thank you so much for being here to each year to present this award and to be a part of this night. Um, tonight, I stand next to somebody incredibly famous, and OJ's with us too. But Shanda is now an award-winning author of a children's book for caregivers. Shanda, remind me the website. It's www.shandaminorbrigance.com. Shanda minorbrigance.com. Check it out. See the book that she's written. Um, you'll be blessed by that. So thank y'all so much for being here. Tonight's winner is a winner that certainly responded and, to be honest, reacted also because he wanted to be authentic and share the reaction that was on his heart. But the response is what drove what would come. And I loved getting to walk that journey. A recent article in the Baltimore Magazine, starts off with these words. The author of the article said, he's right. 
When you stand of this, in the center of this football field in northwest Baltimore, the grass framed by the backs of row houses, a pair of field goal posts, and oak trees with leaves turning shades of yellow, orange, and red on a chilly late fall, you can feel the peace, says Coach Garrick Williams, the 62-year-old founder of the Park Heights Saints youth football program. On March 1st, 2021, Coach Garrick's world was filled with anything but peace. He and his wife, Teresa, received the news that day that their son, Garrick Williams Jr., known to many affectionately as Coach Dip, had been struck by a car and killed. This is not the first time Coach Garrick's peace has been shaken in Park Heights, the community that he loves and serves, but it is undoubtedly the hardest. When I spoke with Coach G, his first words were, I'm not okay. I'm not okay. But that is okay. And it was comforting because the words were shortly followed by a phrase that he says all the time. Don't get it twisted. God's still good. I'm not okay. But don't get it twisted. God is still good. That's what OJ did. This is tough, but God is still good. Before this level of hard ever hit Coach G, Teresa, and their entire family, Coach said this in a magazine. Same article as before. Hard? Everything's hard, but it's about having a purpose. If you don't have a purpose to live, you'll just die of not doing anything. I love people. I don't do this for my own accolades. I do it because I want to change the community. I want to change lifestyles, and this is how to get the message across. That's my purpose. And alongside all of that, we are winners. Coach G, because of your commitment to God, because of your commitment to the community that you live in, because of your commitment to walk through hard times and continue to give God glory, it's my honor and my privilege to present you as this year's winner or recipient recipient of the O.J. Brigant Courage Award. Would you and Teresa join us on stage? Coach G, you would, can have the mic if you would like for just a minute, though. <laughs> Come on, Teresa. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Never changes. And he always got a lamb or in the bush there. I didn't know anything about this. I was sitting there talking to Pastor Tay at the picture that they had in the magazine and I saw something up there about a award. I didn't know anything about award today. You really got me here, Doc. You really got me. Uh, life is hard, but God is good. Um, of course, I'm going to always miss my son. Always going to miss many loved ones I lost, but I know one day that you always recognize and understood that we We'll be together again, and I realize that i um, come to know that I'm not mad with God. I'm mad about what happened. I just know that um, in the end, we're going to win, and uh, 
I'll be with my son again anyhow. That's how we live. That's how we do it. And that's how we're going to be together hand in hand. So I'll let the wife say something because she don't have nothing to say. <laughs> that's the first time. Praise God. After <laughs> This almost this almost like walking on water. God is good. I love you. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Well, hey, if you guys, Teresa, just step right back up here. Just one second. Father God, thank you. Thank you for the men and women on this stage that I get to stand with. Thank you that you grabbed a hold of their life, that you changed their life, that you gave them a hope that surpasses anything that they could go, go through in this world. Thank you that you've held them strong. Father, that you've given them courage to walk through the hard. Father, to, to walk in the hard and to walk with people that also go through hard. All the while pointing to you as the hope and the answer and the reason that we can still have joy no matter what's going on in our world, our community, our teams. Father, we can look to you. Thank you for these examples of that truth. Pray that you would continue to impact the Park Heights community through Garrick, through Teresa, and through the coaches of the Park Heights Saints. Thank you for the way that the community has surrounded them in love. May that remain. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. This ministry has been built on the backs of coaches like Brother Garrick, uh, who have gone in our communities, laid a foundation, and is impacting generations of coaches and athletes right there in Baltimore City. There's plenty of other incredible stories of coaches and athletes who have been impacted by the gospel. Um, and I just want to thank you, Coach Garrick, for all you've done for Park Heights and Baltimore City. It's incredible. It was the summer of 2004. I was 17 years old. I was entering my senior year at Westminster High School. And at that time, I was finding my identity in everything this world had to offer. Self-image, popularity, performance on the lacrosse field. And at that time, I didn't know who Jesus really was and what he did for me. My view of Christianity was a set of standards and morals of what I had to live by and conform my image to. And at that time, my senior year, my number one goal was to get a college scholarship to play Division I lacrosse. And so I tried out for the FCA National Elite Team, and I made that team. And I thought in my mind, my ticket was stamped to achieve my dream. Well, God had different plans for that team in my life. God used FCA staff who organized that team Coaches who shared the gospel with me, just like Brother Garrick does in Baltimore City every day, that my eyes were opened. It was through coaches and staff that spoke my language. They met me right where I was as a lacrosse player, finding my identity in all the things that the world would throw me. And it was there that I realized that my significance and who I was was wrapped up in worldly things, things that would come and go things that could crumble at any moment. And it was there I heard the gospel clearly through these staff and coaches for the very first time, that I was imperfect and that God uh, sent perfection here to this earth in form of man, Jesus, and that he came, he died and rose again for me, for my imperfection and for you and your imperfection. And it is by grace through faith that we may have life and have it abundantly. It's a gift and it's not of works. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, if you'd like to read a little bit more about that. God used that experience in my life to draw me into a relationship with him and my life has forever been changed. In January 2012, God made it abundantly clear to me that he was calling me onto full-time staff with FCA. 
I was the first full-time area representative in Carroll County. And the vision God gave me was simple and clear. It was to replicate that experience that I had as a high school athlete and that gospel message to coaches and athletes in my hometown where I was raised. God grew the ministry beyond my human capacity and it was incredible to watch him raise up staff and grow ministry in Carroll County. In my most recent role, Central Maryland Multi-Area Director, overseeing Frederick, Carroll, and Howard counties, we've seen God do an incredible work. In 2012, a decade ago, really hard to believe, I was the only staff in Carroll County. 10 years have, have gone by, and now we have 14 staff serving in those three counties. God has done a great work. Growing our certified ministry environments by 400% in six years, from 23 to 93 certified ministry environments where coaches and athletes can come together and be led into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ and his church. And last, our local camps in Central Maryland have grown to 560 attendees this past summer in 2022. Uh, a bread and butter of our ministry, a place where coaches and athletes can come at any week of the summer to one of our camps and hear the life-changing message that I heard. The vision God gave me in 2012 will continue to be what guides us in the state of Maryland for the years to come. Tonight, I'm incredibly excited to share three things. The foundation that God has laid through coaches and athletes and volunteers for over 30 years the second, I'm excited to share with you the future, the new and exciting ministry environments that we're going to roll out right here tonight. And then the third thing we're going to talk about is how we're going to fulfill that vision. I'm going to invite up a friend and my mentor, Mike McMahon, Coach Randy, uh, and his wife, Joy Curtin. You guys can come up and join me. Mike McMahon uh, was the first guy I reported to when I came on staff for the first two years. Mike was a spiritual father for me. He's been on staff for 20 years. We talk about foundation while well, you're looking at one of the foundational pieces in the state of Maryland. Mike has a great relationship with the Curtin family. And just as my life was changed through FCA, many, many others have been changed through FCA as well. And I'm excited to hear that tonight. Actually, 24 years. I forget there's other four. Um, you know, if I had to describe ministry in one word, it would be relationships. And, uh, you know, when you get involved with FCA, for those of us who love sports and love Jesus, it's like, man, we need to go to these camps. We get to, to, to hang out with kids and coaches who are like-minded. They think like we do. And um, I remember, I don't even know how many years ago it was, but I remember meeting this young guy. He was still in college. And uh, he had actually met the Lord through the ministry that Mark Stevens helped to, to birth at Salisbury University. I think that's otherwise known as the Ivy League of the <laughs> Eastern Shore. Is that right? Um, so anyway, this guy came to know the Lord through there. And then since he uh, graduated, Randy's been one of those guys that when you ask for something, he's one of the first ones to raise his hand and say, here I am, send me. And so Randy has been involved in the camp ministry. He's been involved in every school that he's been at. He's been involved in um, serving and leading as a huddle coach or a huddle leader. And um, several years ago, we had a coach's Bible study at my house. And uh, I remember Randy would come. And uh, at the end of every study, he would say, you know, we would have a prayer request. And Randy said, um, I just want to godly woman you know send a godly woman my way and one day we're out at uh at my my yard and we had a little baptism party out there and uh his this woman that we know joy beautiful woman right here she happened to be at the house and she asked my wife doesn't mike know any you know single fca guys and uh, my wife says uh i just saw randy curtin with his shirt off at camp i'm thinking <laughs> All right, well, maybe we'll give him a call. So anyway, we did, and, you know, I didn't even have to, I, I didn't even have to, uh, you know, have a dinner with him. Randy said, oh, I'll call her. So he did, and then uh, four kids later, one who actually leads a huddle now at Chesapeake High School, Randy's the head wrestling coach, he leads the huddle. But the reason that I called these guys is to let you know, you know what, you can be a successful coach and athlete and still follow Jesus. And the thing that he's done with both of those 
Chesapeake just won the 3A title at the Anne Arundel County level, the region level, and they just recently won the state duels, and then they won the state individual championships. I just want to say a good round of applause for this guy. We're getting it done. And uh, his assistant coach said, don't mention my name, but Tony Lestorti is here with him. So I just wanted to say that. Thanks, Tony. Anyway, Randy, you guys are up. <laughs> uh, I, <clears throat> I think Mike just stole your speech there a little bit. but um, <laughs> she, Well, she'll tell it again in her own little way. Um, my, my name is Randy Curtin. This is my wife, Joy. Um, FCA has been generational throughout my entire adult life. Um, upon graduating high school in 1998, I went to Salisbury University, which is now the Ivy League. I didn't know that, but now I know that. Um, <laughs> and I, I was on the football team there, and we had mandatory study hall. We had to sit for an hour and a half in silence every evening doing study hall. And in the middle of one of these agonizingly boring study halls, the coach starts speaking about Jesus, like in front of the whole room so everybody could hear. And I never heard anything like it. I don't remember what he said, but something caught my attention. Um, he mentioned to me about an FCA huddle. I said, oh, okay, that's good to know. A few months later, he said something again about Jesus, caught my attention. I said, oh yeah, you know, I might check out that FCA huddle. Um, now I know the Holy Spirit was, you know, working through this coach to reach me. His name was Mark Hanna, by the way. And um, I eventually attended the Bible study, the FCA huddle, and started asking questions about, um, about the Bible. Um, my sophomore year, 1999, um, Coach Hanna spoke at like a pregame chapel, you know, before the football games, and again, um, the Holy Spirit was really working on me. So I just started going to FCA every week at Salisbury. I started asking more and more questions. Um, I, I, asked some, I asked the group, what is a verse that has like a list of all the sins? And somebody said, oh, Galatians 5, 19 to 21, which is right before the fruit of the Spirit. And I went home and I read that and I was like, okay, I, I'm convinced that I am a sinner. Not that I'm this terrible person person, but just like everybody else in the world, you know, all have, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So I prayed my own version of the sinner's prayer that night in my bedroom. I became saved at that moment, November of 1999. I remember thinking about Jesus all the time and um, wanting to study the Bible constantly and just having this Happy, happiness or joy inside of me, I, I guess you, you would call it. It was all because of men like Mark Hanna and Kevin Colleton. And, um, you know, I might not have just gone to a Bible study, but these were my coaches. They, you know, I looked up to these guys. They had a lot of influence over me. I thought they were pretty cool guys. Um, so I'm thankful to FCA for that. Now I'm the head wrestling coach at Chesapeake High School in Pasadena. I get to be an influence to young people, just like these guys were for me 20 some years ago. And um, we have an FCA huddle at our school. My son, Matthew, uh, leads the huddle. He's a ninth grader at the high school. And 15 kids regularly attend the huddle. Um, Mike mentioned the success we had with our team this year that was just really cool to be a part of. Um, and FCA is, near and dear to our hearts for another reason. <laughs> um, so I've known Mike for Mike McMahon for 20 years, and he and his wife, Lisa, knew Joy. Yeah. So when Randy finished college, he, wanted, he knew he wanted to stay involved with FCA, so he started looking at the FCA locally and came across Mike McMahon. So Randy would volunteer as the football coach at a lot of the FCA camps, and he started going to um, the FCA coaches' Bible study with Mike. And his, like Mike was saying, his prayer request every week was that he would meet a godly woman. And um, I had known the McMahons a long time through family, and then after I graduated college, I would work in the medical tent as a nurse at a lot of the FCA camps. And um, one day, I happened to be at the McMahons, and I was like, Lisa, come on, Mike's got to know like a good guy through FCA, right? And um, so she said, all right, Mike gave Randy your number, and I'm telling you, like, that night, Randy called. <laughs> and then it's, it, we got married a year later, and it's been 17 years. So. 
hearing Mike and Joy tell the story, it sounds like I was this like desperate guy. Or something. <laughs> I was asking too. I was asking. <laughs> she too. was asking them too. That's what she was saying. Um, in conclusion, FCA over generations now has been a huge part of our lives. You know, I became saved through FCA. I became nurtured as a baby Christian through FCA. Um, we met each other through FCA. Our son is leading a huddle now at Chesapeake High School. So we're thankful for all of those things. Incredible. That's the foundation, generational impact. 20 years ago, an athlete at Salisbury University heard the gospel. Now he's a head coach, just won a state championship, leading athletes, came uh, to know his wife through FCA, and now his son's leading FCA. That's the foundation of the ministry here in Maryland. FCA has been around since 1954. It was birthed from one man's vision, and now there's over 2,500 people on staff with FCA. The mission of FCA is to lead every coach and athlete into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ and his church. Each year we have a theme, a one word theme that we base our huddles, our camps, our events, all of our environments around. The 2020 one word theme, if you haven't seen it yet, is every. So our mission statement and our one word theme, I think declares that we are really um, passionate about pursuing every coach and athlete. When you pause and think about it, that's a big vision. The foundation has primarily been through campus ministry, where hundreds of coaches and athletes every day gather on campuses, and also through camps. We've, we've done camps for 50 or 60 years, and that's been a bread and butter piece of our ministry. And as our ministry grows globally, um, FCA is intentionally diversifying our strategy in truly reaching every coach and athlete. I'm excited tonight to roll out six new ministry environments that FCA is initiating this year. The first one is action sports, also known as surf and skate and BMX. The second one is motorsports, and for beginners, that's sport with a motor. <laughs> Our third one is club and league. Right here in Maryland, we've had club teams thrive, but ac across the globe, we're putting a lot of effort into multiplying what we've seen through FCA Lacrosse and many other clubs right here in Maryland. The fourth is outdoor sport. This picture was taken at our Western Maryland Power Camp. Again, replicating this, not locally, but on a global scale. And pro and elite is the fifth. And the fi final environment that I am extremely excited to roll out this evening is all ability sport. Two and a half years ago, I was part of the second class of the Don McLennan experience, a select group of emerging leaders on staff with FCA. Two and a half years ago, my huddle of eight staff was given the task of researching and developing what all ability ministry could look like within the context of FCA. All ability sport is creating environments where coaches and athletes with any disability can participate. One thing we learned, which is an incredible stat, is that one seventh of the world's population either has a physical or cognitive disability. So if we wanna reach every, we need to be serious about reaching every. My very first call two and a half years ago when my huddle at Don McLennan experience was assigned all ability sport was to Miles Taylor. Miles, come up and join us. <laughs> Miles and I go way back. I told you I came on staff in 2012. Miles was a a uh, senior at Westminster High School, and I was just figuring out uh, what ministry looked like on staff in 2012. God strategically uh, built a relationship between us 10 years ago, and if any of you guys were here two years ago, Miles and I stood on this very same stage, and Miles received the O.J. Brigant's Courage World Award. <laughs> Award. 
Two years later, Miles, we both get to stand on the stage incredibly excited to launch a brand new ministry with an FCA. Miles, I'd love for you to relive that call that we had two and a half years ago, the excitement that we had that FCA was launching this new ministry. Tell us why you're so excited about all ability sport. You can come right here. Uh, when, when I had a call from Brandon, he came up to uh, the ranch, the RBR, which is where I work, and we had a two-hour uh, conversation just about uh, the all ability sport. And like, like I was telling him about, like, what, what fellowship of good athletes means to me, and, like the community, and to be able to bring that to, to people with disabilities just means so much to me and the disability community. Mm. Yeah. Miles. So in your experience, and when we look biblically, can you tell us more about why you have a heart and what Jesus has done uh, for people, all people, but also people with disability? Of course. So, uh, as many know, I have, I have CP. And for a lot of my life, especially in the world of uh, sport, like I, I, I have had to... They kind of like find with my own way, <laughs> kind of like carve up my own path. But with what FDA is doing with the All Ability campaign, is giving the opportunity to so many people with disabilities to be able to call themselves athletes and to play the sport that they love. And if I want to be truly honest with you guys, uh, this is what Jesus wants us to do. This is because uh, Jesus, he's still the unfortunate. He, he's still the poor. He's still the disabled. And like, this is what truly the discipleship looks like. Mm. And like, and we're all doing it in the name of the Lord. And that is what it's all about. It's mm. <laughs> 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 amazing. Incredible, incredible. Miles, thank you so much for sharing. The one thing that gets me really excited, many of you may have seen Miles deadlift a couple years ago. The video was incredible. Um, Miles uh, was a part of the Westminster football team, embraced by the team. It was incredible. And then, then to go watch you excel at powerlifting, uh, doing something, creating your own path similar to what you just said. Uh, we're super excited within the context of FCA to put some structure around this and to put a lot of effort and energy around this to allow athletes with all ability to be involved in our ministry at any capacity. Miles, thank you so much for helping us dream this vision up. <laughs> Through the Don McLennan experience, I met a guy named Tristan Griffin. Tristan is our Akron, Ohio uh, multi-area director. Two and a half years ago, we presented all ability sports at the Don McLennan experience. Tristan immediately caught the vision and immediately took action. Last summer, FCA's first all ability camp was pioneered by Tristan. Let's take a look. 
It's an FCA All Abilities Camp. It's the first of its kind. We've got campers ages 2 to 27, all with disabilities. We anticipated maybe a handful or 20, 30, 40 kids and volunteers, and just to see it turn into over 100 it was really, really magical. You see campers having a blast because they're being celebrated. You see volunteers that are coming alongside of campers, and you see mission happening. No matter where they come from, no matter what they look like, uh, no matter what their background is, they're here with a sole purpose. And as a special needs mom, it's just, it's kind of mind blowing, like nothing I've ever seen. People with disabilities are traditionally underserved in two realms. One would be in the church and the other would be in the sports realm. These kids are not included in sports, they just aren't. But they're created in God's image, and they need to be celebrated as such. And so, FCA as an organization is perfectly positioned to start serving this community. But it always takes a visionary, and Tristan Griffin has been given that vision with his wife, Melanie. He said, hey, I want to do something, and it's going to be big. The story of camp starts with my daughter being born. Uh, we found out she had a disability, and we decided we've got to figure out what it looks like to serve her and people like her. So it ends up working out that I was able to turn that into a dream for camp. It was intimidating on the front end. I had to start doing research with all sorts of organizations that do work in this realm. So Special Olympics. Caregivers, nurses, special needs experts. Even the local children's hospital, our local developmental disabilities board. Donors, partners, board members. And turn it into an all abilities camp. And it was incredible to see not only 10, 20, 30, but 180 volunteers who come out for it. One buddy for every camper, and then we have another 70 volunteers that are here as well. Coming together to serve. I don't think anybody expected it to just grow and blow up so rapidly. The feeling of acceptance is just wonderful. It is needed. It's absolutely necessary. If Tristan and Melanie Griffin and their dear little daughter Scout, the special needs, can step out in faith for this, then what can he do for you? Well, I'm excited to announce we will be launching four all ability camps across the state this summer. I've been on the call a number of times with Tristan Griffin, and we've laid out uh, the foundation of one of our camps in Central Maryland this July 30th, and we have three other camps being rolled out across the state. These camps take a lot of effort. They'll take a lot of staff, a lot of coaches, a community coming together, as you saw in Tristan's video. The funds raised tonight will also help us launch this brand new ministry of all ability sport in four different areas of Maryland. Another thing that uh, has been incredible is when we see this graph on the stage, the growth of our staff. Staff growth has almost tripled in the past 12 years. And as we roll out these six new initiatives within FCA, I anticipate our staff growth is gonna continue to triple over the next decade as well through all ability sport, action sport, outdoor sport, pro and elite, and et cetera, et cetera. Because of our staff growth, you've seen huddles grow, you've seen camps grow, and you've also seen, obviously, the budget grow. There's a lot of environments, a lot of new initiatives being rolled out that I'm ex super excited uh, to initiate within the state. And this next graph of our state shows our multi-area breakdown. One of the all-ability sports is going to happen in Western Maryland. Uh, one's going to happen in Montgomery County. One's also going to happen in Baltimore County through FCA Lacrosse, And one's going to happen in Carroll County. If you'd like to be involved, please get connected. There's contact information in the, uh, in the bulletin. This map, there's a vision-based staffing plan within each multi-area. For us to truly fulfill our vision and mission of leading every coach and athlete, into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, we need to have a strategic plan. Each multi-area director in those areas has a, a vision-based staffing plan to do just that. 
the funds given this evening are also going to help our staff expand the ministry to truly reach every coach and athlete. 18 years ago, I was led into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ and his church. Now God is leading me uh, into the state director role right here in Maryland. I am the mission of FCA fulfilled. Tonight we're enjoining, we are asking you to join us to see the mission of every coach and athlete reached across the state of Maryland. We'd like to turn our attention to the screens of our brand new staff, Jordan Pugh, who just came on staff at Loyola University. I was first introduced to FCA when I was 11 years old at my middle school huddle back in Montgomery County. Throughout the years after that, I went to camp and I served as a huddle leader on my high school huddle, but I never really saw the impact that FCA was having in my life as a student athlete and as a believer. When I went to college my freshman year, I was faced with a lot of the things that many of our college athletes are faced with. Injury, questioning whether I was going to transfer, and just lack of a community where I was at. I remember my high school area rep reached out to me one day when I was sitting in class and asked if I would be interested in interning with Montgomery County. I don't really know what provoked me to say yes, other than the Holy Spirit, but I remember thinking this is something I should go for. That summer, I was faced with a lot of tough decisions, whether or not I was going to transfer, whether I was going to get surgery, and a lot of other things that were facing me at that point in my life. Through the friendships that I made that summer, I remember feeling what it truly felt like to have Christian community for the first time and learning about who I was and who my identity was in Christ. I went on to intern two more times and even traveled to Malaysia with a college group to serve with our FCA staff overseas. When my senior year came around, I was in the middle of COVID and I was kind of determining where I was gonna go after I graduated and what I was gonna do. Through those relationships, through my internship, and through a lot of prayer and fellowship and questioning where God wanted me and where he was leading me, I felt called to join FCA staff. In the last six months, as an area rep at Loyola, Maryland in Baltimore City, I've been able to form these relationships with current student athletes and have been able to meet them where they were at and have relationships and mentorship similar to where I was five years ago. It's been so cool to see God's hand and how he's prepared me over the last five years in ways that I never could have imagined and helped me with those relationships and the people that I still go to to this day. It's been an honor to be a part of FCA staff and to see how God has led me into this direction to further his kingdom. I have the uh, privilege of introducing Larry Moody, a state board member and the PGA Champions Tour Chaplain. Larry's going to uh, invite you guys to join us in ministry. Thank you, Larry, so much. Thank you, my friend. Wow, what an evening. Uh, what incredible ministry FCA is doing here in the state of Maryland. I had the privilege of being on the search committee uh, and interviewing uh, the four candidates and asking God who should be the person to replace Sean. Uh, and I can tell you that all four were very qualified to be the state director, but all of us felt that Brandon was the man for this time at this hour uh, to direct uh, this ministry of trying to reach every coach an athlete into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ and his church. It's my privilege to come tonight and invite you to be a part of this with us. And uh, I'm going to ask that the house lights come up a little bit, if we could. I want to tell you about four great opportunities to invest in tonight. Um, the first one is the one you've just been watching. Uh, if Miles doesn't excite you, I don't know what excites you. Uh, I want you to take your pulse uh, if he doesn't excite you about what he's doing. It, the, the first is the all uh, abilities camp. What we would love to do tonight is raise $45,000 to help fund the all ability camps. Uh, this is a critical ministry opportunity. 
Uh, I have headed uh, different Christian organizations. I serve on the national board of several Christian organizations, and I'm here asking you all for money in something my wife and I personally invest in. For the last six years, we have been monthly donors to this ministry because we think it is such a great investment opportunity. When Paul asked the people in Philippians to invest in him, it wasn't for his sake. He said, I'm asking you to be a part of the ministry because you get the eternal benefit. Uh, my wife and I feel that we have eternal dividends in heaven because of what the staff in this state of FCA uh, are doing, and we've been really blessed. The second thing we want to do, there is a new Bible, an E3 uh, a Bible, study Bible, that is incredible, that's just hot off the press. In fact, I understand I have only one of two in the Mid-Atlantic region right now that truly is hot off the press. We're looking to raise $10,000 for a thousand of these to be put in the hands of coaches and kids so that they can know God's word better. The third thing we're looking to do tonight is raise another $45,000 for the support of our staff. We're talking about growing staff. We're talking about the staff we already have. We have the opportunity to do that. That's a total of $100,000. Now, I got to tell you why my wife and I, who are in Christian ministry, are already investing in FCA. I want you to put up what the charity navigator says uh, about FCA and its financial stewardship. For 16 consecutive years, it has the four-star top rating. That's the top 1% of all charities. If you're wondering if your money is being used the way that you want it to be in used and for it to have eternal value, FCA is a wise investment for you. I'd like to ask uh, the folks that are the table hosts, or if you don't have a, a table host, there's an envelope in the middle of your table. If you would take that envelope, and if each of you would uh, grab an envelope. I got a guard. Sean and Brandon would never forgive me if that uh, Bible disappeared out of their sight tonight. So, Steve, I'm leaving it in your good hands to protect it, okay? <laughs> I, I want to uh, ask you to consider the opportunity of supporting our staff, and if every person would take one of those envelopes... Uh, and by the way, if you wanted to do something tonight and didn't want to just do this, we're so savvy tech right now. There's a uh, QR code on the envelope that you could take a picture of and you can actually invest that way if you don't want to fill out an envelope. The scan card is right there. Take some time to fill out your name and address, email, city, state, zip code. Now again, God's the one that needs to impress your heart, not me, to pressure you to give to FCA. I'm just telling you, my wife and I will fill this out and we will invest and continue to invest in this ministry because we think it is such a great opportunity to send it on ahead all the stuff you and I have in our garage in our storage units in our basements that's all going to burn someday but you and I have the opportunity to send it on ahead and investing in people like Brandon Kids like that who have come to Christ through FCA and to watch them grow is an incredible opportunity and investment. 
You can do it by debit or credit card. You can do one time. You can do monthly. My wife and I, for six years, have been monthly uh, donors to FCA. And it's one of the greatest investments we make. Uh, if you get that uh, uh, QR code, you can also see the different staff and who the different people are to invest. You can invest in the Maryland State. You can invest in what Sean is doing is the Regional Talent Advancement. Coach Albert's Bible Fund, that's putting those study Bibles in the hands of all those kids. Uh, the Art Taguiting uh, Ohana Camp Scholarship Fund, the Special Project, the All Abilities Camp, and if you have the name of the staff that is in your area or someone you're already supporting and want to even add to the support of what they're doing, we encourage you to do that. I think this is my uh, coming on to my third year of serving on the board of the FCA state. And I marvel every time I get the reports of the number of student athletes, coaches that are responding to the good news of Jesus. And if things keep going in the world the way they're going, Jesus may return sooner than we think. Let me tell you, more people need to hear the good news uh, instead of all the bad news of what Jesus has to offer. We've got uh, a video that's going to play while you finish out um, your cards. And when you're done, put them in the envelope at your table, don't join tables. Put it in the envelope that's at your table, and then we'll have uh, the table host uh, or uh, ushers will come and collect them. Uh, but while you're doing that, we got a two-minute video that uh, is going to show you what has been accomplished in the ministry in 2021. You're the first people to see this video. Larry, thank you. Uh, it is an honor to have a mentor and a friend up here um, to, to be a part of this night, and so many of you. What an incredible blessing. The website that that QR code goes to, if you didn't get to see it, is MDFCA, so like Maryland Fellowship of Christian Athletes, mdfca.org slash invest. So if you want that, you can get to that 
um, at any time. Now it is my privilege and my honor to take us to uh, a really fun part of the night. I get to invite two friends in ministry to join me on the stage. Two guys that one of them you may know his name, the other one many of you know because he's been so involved in this community and you may know some of his athletic stories as well. So I want to invite uh, Johnny Shelton and Matt Stover to the stage. Matt has decided to leave, so it's just Johnny and I, which is awesome. The Lord, no. oh, there you are, Matt. Come on, run for us. Uh, he's a kicker. He's like, no, I'm not. I didn't know it was right there. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. We just wasted a time out, but yeah, that's yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Well, guys, uh, thanks so much for being a part of this night. Thanks so much for being a part of SCA. Um, it has been a lot of fun uh, to do ministry with you guys. Our friend Garrick Williams, who won the O.J. Brigant's Courage Award, um, I didn't tell Johnny I was going to share this, but the, the very day that, that they lost their son, Johnny was in the living room uh, with Coach G that day, um, which was incredible. Um, the response with everything on your plate to, to shut things down and get over there to be with Coach is huge. So thank you for that. Oh, man, I, I'm so, so glad that we were able to do it. Uh, not just myself, um, Coach Harbaugh, a few other people that was able to come out just, show, just to show the love of God to, to a man who has served tirelessly uh, to that community. So it was, it was God's calling. That's awesome. Well, hey, I want to start by just introducing not everybody in the room uh, knows you guys. So if you could just tell us a little bit about who you are, your family, your athletic accolades, Johnny, and Matt, tell us a little bit about your career too. Um, and let us know a little bit about who you are. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go first because mine is short. Um, <laughs> no, but I'm Johnny Shelton. I'm the, I serve as the chaplain for the Baltimore Ravens. Uh, we just finished our ninth season uh, there or here in uh, Baltimore. It's been a blessing. Uh, my wife and I, who are empty nesters now, we have two young adults, uh, a son and a daughter who lives in North Carolina. Um, you know, we've been involved with FCA. I consider ourselves an FCA family. You know, we've been involved with FCA all from my freshman year in high school up until now in different capacities. So well, you were on the, the staff, board. though, right? I was, on, I was on staff as well. Right. So, um, we, we, we've done it all. Uh, God, God has called us, um, and I'll share a little bit about it later, but to, to be able to be introduced to a ministry that serve athletes took a young guy like me, whose sports was everything, um, it just means a lot. So we're, we're here to serve. Awesome. You had a stint in the NFL too, right? I had a cup of coffee. Legit cup of coffee in the NFL. <laughs> had, a, had a cup of coffee. No, we, we were blessed, man, to be able to just have the opportunity. We started, I was an undrafted free agent, um, went to the Atlanta Falcons um, during, a, during a time where, as, as you all know right now, free agency is getting ready to start. I came in right when free agency was being introduced, which made a guy like me that's on the bubble, made it even harder uh, to make it in. And so, but I was with the Atlanta Falcons and went from there to the San Francisco 49ers. Um, and then I had a couple of camp tryouts with uh, Seattle Seahawks and the then LA Raiders for you older people who remember <laughs> the Raiders was in LA. That's awesome. They I told me the they Coliseum. Yes, I did. <laughs> That's awesome. Matt, give us a little bit of your story, your family and your athletic background. I had a cup of coffee in the NFL, but it was 20 years of it. So, you know, <laughs> a lot of coffee, but I didn't play. I actually kicked, you know, remember, I, I didn't play, play in the NFL. Let's get that out of the way. They literally are able to get a cup of coffee oh, yes. during practice. Oh, yes. Hey, when the guys are in meetings, what do you think we... I got one play I had to know, guys. <laughs> it didn't take me very long to get out of a meeting. I had lots of coffee I could drink. 
<laughs> that is for sure. Oh, gosh, yes. Uh, I had, a, as you heard, 20 years in the NFL, but uh, uh, it was a blessing. During the course of my career, I came across great men like Johnny. And, and uh, just to get this out of the way, I, they wanted to make this a Q&A with me and, and having Johnny answer, ask all the questions. I'm going, uh-uh. I love his story, and he's in the trenches, and I wanted us to be a duel up here because we have a lot to share with, with, with you and with one another. Uh, I, Johnny and I really got to know each other while we, were, we uh, traveled to Israel together. Uh, 30 of us in the NFL were, had the privilege of gathering in 2016 right, and 17, and got together, and we, we got to know each other real well there, and since then, Johnny and I have been friends. But uh, as an NFL athlete, uh, we tended to move around. I just recently moved to Texas, uh, back home where my wife and I grew up, and that was because my 18-year-old is a very good golfer, and it was better served in Texas than in Maryland, right? I mean, it just happens to be the way, and he just signed a to go play at Texas A&M University. So uh, I've been leading my family and been doing my best to uh, serve them. It's my wife's turn now, so I'm building her the home that she's been wanting since I got into the NFL. So right, ladies, I'm going to build her the home that she's so deserved and paid for, her on her own. Um, I have uh, three children, Jenna, Jacob, and Joe. Jenna and Jacob were both born on the same birthday a year apart. You got to be a very accurate kicker to get that done. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Thanks, Bill Belichick. Now we won't go there. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Joe's my youngest. Uh, he came seven years after the fact. But uh, my older two were both uh, lacrosse players. Uh, my daughter played Division Three lacrosse at Messiah University. Was an All-American there. And my uh, oldest son Jacob was a profession now a professional lacrosse player, but he was an All-American at Loyola University here. They all went to McDonough School where they were blessed. And uh, Rob Schmutz here and and Tim Foster with the focus is here. So great to see them. Uh, and from there, you know, you look at uh, how things. I grew up in Dallas, so that's why we ended up back in Texas. And uh, now I'm serving. Uh, 49 states and 19 countries with nonprofit uh, back office uh, work with my uh, Players Philanthropy Fund. It started out with Ed Reed as my first client, and now we've grown into over 380 clients. And we have ministries here and uh, in Baltimore, from the Baltimore Life Coaches to, to several others that were able to facilitate uh, their giving by giving them their nonprofit status, and we do all the back office and make sure that they're compliant. And uh, it's really grown into an amazing thing. Uh, we're doing cryptocurrency, and can you believe that the majority of the cryptocurrency is owned by a lot of Christians? Did you know that? <laughs> right? You would have never known that, but uh, millions of dollars is going through. So if you're a ministry, you need to learn how to receive crypto, and I can help you with that. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and, well. you know, at the end of the day, uh, it was just a, it was a, it was a thrill to be a part of the FCA and uh, I've been on the state board before, and I've served uh, FCA uh, through the capacity. And, of course, uh, Tom Landry, I grew up watching and knew the, the – but I was not ready in my high school years to hear the FCA message. But uh, it's been a pivotal part in my life. That's awesome. Thank you. So, yeah, you can clap for that. As we talked, there was a lot – this theme of empowerment. We've heard Brandon talk about kind of the, the strategy of FCA, engage, equip, empower – and as we talked the other day, what just kept coming to mind was empowerment and the way these guys are empowering others, the way that they've been empowered and uh, just kind of the whole definition of that. It's given somebody the chance to achieve something great or to achieve something by investing into them is to empower them. So Matt, you kicked 354 field goals uh, for the Ravens that went through. You kicked some more. I yes, think. I did. You missed I missed about 100 of them. You know. Missed about 100 of them, but you kicked 18 game-winning field goals. What's going through your mind? Like, that, that's a heavy load. Like, you're empowered to now go win the game. What's going through your mind at that moment? Lord Jesus, <laughs> help me. <laughs> and I'm not kidding you. <laughs> that's what I would say. Uh, but I would say this, Sean, uh, looking back at all the times that I, I was put in that situation, I desired that situation. I was a kid, the little kid in fifth grade that would 
say, Coach, put me in, put me in. I want the ball. I want the ball. And I typically got the ball when I was a little kid. And then get to put myself out on an NFL field, the only way I was going to get the ball is to be able to kick it. But that also required me to be put in a position to win the game many, many a times. In fact, over 40 times I was put into that situation where it was to go ahead, right, in the fourth quarter. But 18 of those were last second. And so either you make it or you miss it at that point. So um, if, you, if you ask the best kickers in the league or you look at especially like a Justin Tucker, he wants that ball. And that is the most important, I, I think, trait that any kicker could have outside of his talent is that he wants, wants the ball. That's awesome. You said one time if you were facing a kicker that was up in that situation on the other team, what was your phrase to them? If you get it, hit it. Because I know the pain and it costs you if you miss it. And I always wanted to empower that other guy on the other team. I did because that is just something I don't wish on anybody unless it was in a Super Bowl, which I got a Super Bowl ring from when Nor Norwood went right, right, <laughs> wide right on that. So I was with the Giants in 1990 and got that ring, sorry. but uh, <laughs> Speaking of pain, how many times did you feel that pain? Uh, three times you out of remember. the 18, yeah, I, I, I missed it, and yes, they hurt, and you do take it on your back, and, and Sean, it is, a, um, it is something you take personal, because you were trusted with the football for that team at that moment, no matter if you were being paid or not, it didn't matter to me. Um, I wanted that ball, I expected to make the kick, didn't ever go out there thinking I was going to miss it, and when it didn't go through, it, it, it's painful. There, there were games where I missed three field goals and I took full responsibility for it. I only did that once, and, uh, but you, you take personal responsibility for it, and then you deal with it, and then you move on, and you become the guy that they can depend on after that. That's awesome. Now, when you're going out there, it, the coach sends you out, he's empowered you, you're the one doing it. But along the way, there were a lot of other people that engaged you, that equipped you, that prepared you for that moment. Tell us a story like just one person that came along and got you ready for those moments. Well, you know, nobody here has not had help in their life. Can we say that, right? Amen? Amen. And I've had that help as well, going back from my father giving me the opportunity, right? My mother, the sacrifices they made to give me the opportunity, the coaches around me, the pump passing kick opportunity. In 1979, I won the whole state of Texas in the region and, and uh, had, had the recreation center, Skyline Recreation Center supporting me there. Uh, Greg Porter kicked for the uh, San Antonio Generals USFL team behind my high school kicking, and he would give me the rhyme to the reason on how to kick field goals. And my high school coach, Joe Bob Johnson, we were in Texas, remember, Joe Bob. And, uh, and then Louisiana Tech giving me a shot. shot and, uh, and then, of course, you get drafted by the Giants. And I would say that the single most um, person who gave me the biggest shot I ever had in my lifetime was Bill Belichick. Um, he was the coach uh, for the Cleveland Browns from 1991 to 95, and he gave me the opportunity and trusted me and gave me the opportunity to grow uh, as a young kicker. And by the third year, uh, I started kicking at an elite level, and uh, he gave me those two years to grow in, in that godforsaken place. Sorry, it was hard to kick there. But, uh, you know, he, uh, he, he was a, a huge piece of it. And, of course, uh, John Harbaugh and I have a great relationship, and we, I kicked him into the AFC Championship with a, the biggest kick of my career. It was the last kick I ever kicked as, an, as a Raven. And then prior to that, of course, uh, Brian Billick and special teams coaches. So, and my wife, I would say, without giving any further, I would have not made it one year in the NFL without her support, without her investing in us and giving me that, that home that we know, Johnny and I know, that if that's not stable there, it's going to affect you on the field. And she gave me that environment that uh, I came home unconditionally and was loved and, and was supported. So uh, she was the greatest influence I had in, in my entire career. That's awesome. Johnny, I want to turn to you just a little bit, and Matt's talking about kicking field goals. You were empowered, and you took a position at Virginia Tech. Some people may not know that. Uh, you worked there as a chaplain, and you walked into, or shortly after walking into the position, there was a very high-pressure situation, a lot more serious than, than kicking a field goal. Um, talk to me about what happened when you arrived at Virginia Tech and how equipped or under-equipped you felt and how you got through that. Yeah, um, man, I'll never forget it. We It was April, I started April 1st, um, 2007. And for those that remember, April 16th, uh, there was a shooting 
that was on campus and where 32 or 33 people lost their lives. And we'd been there just two weeks, man. And I mean, our, our boxes were still packed. And we, I got a call that morning from, a, from one of the football players saying that there's been a shooting on campus. Dry, and, and I drove there immediately and they wasn't, they wasn't letting anyone in. And I was so new, I hadn't even gotten my, my pass yet to get on, to get in inside. But through God's grace, they let me in. And it was just devastating. It was, it was, it was one of those things where God confirmed my calling, you know, to that campus. Because to be able to go on campus and see the looks of, of athletes, coaches, staff, they were just walking around like zombies, just in a state of shock, not knowing what, what to do and how to do it. And I'm like, God, nobody but you can handle this situation right here. And so through the Holy Spirit, man, um, and, and FCA, we were, we were able to quickly get some food from Chick-fil-A, and we went to a location, and we just opened up the, the place, man, to be able to have them, the athletes, to come in. And we were able to empower and give hope, you know, during that crisis, man. And, and God moved in, in powerful ways. That's one way that, that you've used what God's given you and used a platform and passed it off and to be able to use that to, to serve others well. As we think about this principle of engage, equip, and empower, um, 2 Timothy 2.2 comes to mind. Take what's been given to you, pass it off to other faithful men and women who will give it to others still. Uh, Matt, how has God used uh, sport and the platforms that he's given you to do that? Well, I'll tell you, when I came to the Baltimore Ravens in uh, 1996, I came from a new babe in Christ from 1992 to 1995, and I get to the uh, Baltimore Ravens, and I, I run into a guy named Joe Ehrman. <laughs> and Joe was with uh, Larry Moody and, of course, with Dave Kruger, who were both here with Search Ministries, and they were the interim uh, chaplains for the Baltimore Ravens. And uh, they finally shared with me that, you know what, Stove? Christianity isn't about you. It's about God, how God's going to use you. And so I began to understand what true ministry was. And, um, you know, so that I, I engaged with people and I learned how to do that within my career. And, and Johnny and I, are, I think he's a pretty seasoned veteran with nine years. And, and I feel like as an athlete, as somebody in the, in the locker room, you have your own ministry there. And Johnny's there to facilitate you within that ministry and to help you grow within that ministry so that you can carry it outside. And uh, Rod Harrison did an excellent job of that. And, of course, during the, prior to Johnny. And, and at that time, Joe Ehrman did a fantastic job of teaching me what it really meant to be that type of uh, person in the locker room to be able to invest in others and earn the right to speak. Uh, in the locker room, as a kicker, Right, um, outside of the normal uh, look as an NFL athlete and also the role. But I had that understanding that if I could gain the right to, to speak truth to somebody and they would do it and they would sit in the stool next to me, uh, then I'm doing a good job within that ministry. And it happened time and time again because there's many guys that I've helped disciple and also helped lead to the Lord based on just that. You know, one thing as a chaplain, uh, to have guys like... Matt, in the locker room, uh, a Christian, it, it, it's those guys who do the influence. We, we, like, again, he, he said we just facilitate it, but it's those guys, peer to peer, being able to, and it's hard in the NFL locker room. It's, it's so hard. It's, it's just like, I mean, it's a microcosm of what happens in your workplace, and but, but you just have a bunch of men and a bunch of egos, a bunch of all of this testosterone in that room. And, and to have a, a, a guy, a player, who loves the Lord and, and you're able to disciple that player and show him the way and empower him to go and do it, that's what it's all about. 
and Johnny's doing an excellent job with that. He's in the trenches right now, and uh, he knows the players who he can invest in, but we're always seeking others, and we're always trying to plant the seed. I know there's many a times when before in a pregame, right, what, what do you ask for in, in the seed? Hey, hey, Johnny, or hey, Stove, come over here and hit me, and they want a prayer. Right? They want to be prayed over. And I mean, there's Ray Lewis times asking me, hey, Stove, you got to hit me today, man. Come on. I need you. Right? <laughs> I said, I need to hit you. I'm good there, you know. But, <laughs> Don't hit him. But, uh, you know, those are the things that we deal with. But uh, it, it, it's a difficult environment. But if you understand that uh, it is a microcosm of what we deal with every day and to learn how to do it, I, I was challenged by, by the search and by, uh, you know, Dave and Larry and, and um, uh, Jorm. And to, if you learn how to do it in that environment, environment, you have the privilege right now of having the entire country right there and to be able to, to minister and to be that Christian man. And then if, the, first of all, you have to be able to walk the walk, right, Johnny? I mean, they're, they're looking to see if you walk in good times and in bad. Um, and then if you, can, if you can't be that guy that they can depend on and trust, and then you can get, share the gospel, that's a huge piece. Yeah. Johnny, uh, Matt said you're in the trenches, so you're actually walking this out this year right now. Uh, with some of the Baltimore Ravens. There's some athletes in the room, some soccer players in the back, some soccer players over here. There's other athletes too, but I don't know any of them, only the soccer players. <laughs> so if you could, um, maybe think about, and I didn't prepare you for this one, but what's a piece of advice you gave an athlete this year in the Ravens locker room that might help athletes in this room to think about how they live out their faith uh, through the sport that they love? Well, one thing that I've learned that was that was given to me. You know, if we look at, and, and, we, and if we put Jesus as our role model um, and how he handled ministry, it's three things that, that I do, that I hand to the, to the athletes. We should love all. Through loving all, we're gonna help many. And by helping many, we'll disciple a few. And so if we can just keep that in the forefront of our mind, not we, we have to understand we're called for a purpose. We're called for specific people. And so by loving them all, we're going we're gonna to cover the whole room, the whole building. But all of them are not going to come to us. I remember early when, when I would get discouraged as a, as a young chaplain when, when some guys didn't pay attention to what I, or appear to not pay attention to what I was saying. And I would go home and my wife and I would pray and she would say, you're not going to save them all. And, and I'd say, well, but, but I want to. And then, and then she'd say, well, you're not going to save any of them. The Holy Spirit will. And, so, and I learned that along the way. You know, we just love them all, help many, and you're going to disciple a few. And so you take those few and you pour into them and then it will multiply. That's awesome. He said, love all, and Matt turned to me, and he said, every. <laughs> love every. I don't know, Brandon, you should mark that down. That might ought to be a theme in our mission statement or something, like every means every. We should say something like that one day. Johnny, tell me, um, what's the win for, for you? As you're in ministry, I know you're an athlete, right? So you know you're aiming for a win, What's the win for you at the end of the day uh, in the work that you do in the locker room? The win, the win for me is, is being able, th this past weekend, I was able to, I had an opportunity to do a wedding, officiate a wedding of a former player. Um, and saying all that, the win for me is not necessarily for the current players who, who I'm discipling right now. The win for me is the former players to, to, to see that they are men of God, that they are godly husbands, godly fathers, you know, doing the things that was poured into them. And if they're doing that and they're discipling a few, that's the win. That's awesome. So the win is not about the game and the scoreboard. Well, you don't care if you win. No, we want to. We want to win some games. Now. Oh, okay. All right. Just want to make <laughs> sure not, it's okay. There, man. <laughs> that's not. Yeah, Coach that's Harbaugh not, would have been like, get him out of here. No, that's not Coach the Blake's, win. Okay, but we want to win. All right. So, so on that note, Matt, I want to turn to you because I, you've shared your story with me, and 
I know you chased some wins and you got some wins and you found out it wasn't the win that you thought it was. So tell us a little bit about that. You know, to answer the question alongside of Johnny as well, on top of that is uh, a win for me was that my teammates called me a great teammate. That was more important to me that I was a great teammate than I was a great kicker. I knew that if I did my job, that was my job. But, you know, to, to have them trust me and, and, and to be that guy that, you know, Ray Lewis says to me, he says, uh, Stova, I'll always respect you because you always were who you were. You weren't somebody else. Um, and to me, that, that was incredibly important to me. And, um, you know, when I was going through my life and, and I always looked at the athlete as the most popular guy in the room and, and uh, the guy who had all the success in life, right, Johnny? I mean, we... Uh, that was my aspiration, and you know, and if I knew I was the popular guy, then I could get all the women, right? Amen, right? I was, uh, and I, 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 you know, everybody's. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You kind of, you know, and I did marry the the cheerleader. Yes, I did. So, uh, and then uh, after, you know, if you had your athletic success and you had your your your, you know, the other success and. Then you ended up being uh, financial success. And I was tracing, chasing this dream that the world was teaching me. And, of course, this is from the book of Seasons of Life written by Joe Ehrman and Jeffrey Marks. And, and it rang true to me because uh, during the time when I was developing my testimony that I'm sharing with you now, uh, Joe was actually writing the book, uh, Seasons of Life. This is back in the mid-'90s. And um, it rang true to me because I was seeking what the world had taught me. If you get this and you acquire this, you're going to have peace and happiness. You're going to have joy in your life. And when I acquired it back in 1990, I was drafted by the New York Giants in 1990. And um, 12th round, third to last pick, yes, I was. <laughs> last man standing in the draft, but yes. Uh, I would say that when you look back at that, and, and I require, acquired it, and then I got into the NFL, and I kicked 1991. And my wife, as faithful as she was, she signed us up for a, uh, uh, an athlete conference called Pro Athletes Outreach. It is a ministry designed for professional athletes. And God had prepared my heart because during the course of that season, it was very difficult. And fellas, I was in my first year of a marriage. I'm sure some of us can empathize there. I didn't understand what that was until I got into it. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I was woken up. And then I understood that my identity had been all wrapped up in this career. And it was very, very, very what I heard, hard. Right, Garrett? It was just hard. Nothing that you've been through. But that was my heart at the time. And I missed a 19-yard field goal. To, tie, to win the game against the Houston Oilers back in 1991. Come on now, you're taking me back, right? You can't kick a shorter field goal than 19 yards. <laughs> the ball was on the half-yard line, right? And talking about humiliating, I missed the field goal. I go down and in the end. I didn't know, realize what I was asking at the time, but I said, Lord, help me. Now, during the course of my growing up, I thought that, you know, if I went to church and I'd check the box on Sunday and, you know, I, I, that's who I was. It was a good luck charm, you know, on, on when I was praying. And, but there was no relationship there. There was no authentic love. There was no surrender to, to Jesus at the time. And when I heard the gospel for the first time, for what good is it for, for the gain of the whole world? You had forfeit your own soul because as an athlete, you have the world, right? It, it's there. And I was empty, and it was miserable, and it was hard, and I surrendered my life in 1992 at that conference because Ken Hutchison broke me down. Yes. You know Ken, right? He broke me down, and uh, that's when my relationship began because I asked Jesus to come into my life and to forgive me of my sins, and I had to realize that he is the true God of Israel. He is the Messiah. He is the one that I, uh, that can forgive me. He lived a perfect life and he died and, he, and he's alive. He's not dead. Amen. He is alive. And I trust that. And so with that, I, I surrendered it. And then a new life began and the old Matt was dead. Didn't mean that old Matt couldn't creep his head up. Right guys? Right? You know what I'm talking about? But it was, it, he was dead. And then I began this journey and uh, through 1991 through 95, I was given a lot of great tools to work with. And, of course, in 96, I shared with you. But since that time, and if you look at my career, from 1991 to 92, I was a subpar kicker. In 1993, God had put it on me. And I, I know that I'm, it's a minus a minute here, and I'll be quick. But, and, Johnny, you can, you can empathize with this, and I'm sure you can add to it, that in 1993, I had a lot of competition 
Brian, uh, Bill Belichick put on three different kickers in training camp on me just in case if one guy couldn't beat me, I beat him. Another guy beat me. Uh, he wouldn't beat me, and I, I, I kept beating him. And so finally by the third time, uh, I beat the guy. I got the job. And in 1992, what had happened and why I, I came to that point where I had so much competition is that I gave God my life, but I didn't give him football. Mm. And football was mine. That was mine. Football was in here, and God couldn't get in there because I had my, wrist, my, my fist around it. But you know what pain will do to you, meaning a bulging disc in L, L3, L4? You know what pain will do to you? It'll break you down, won't it? Haven't you seen a lot of athletes, guys in the NFL? Pain will take you down. And God, over the course of 1992, just broke me, broke me, broke me. And finally, I just said, and he was just hammering on me. And I gave up. I gave him football in 1992. 93, he put me to the test again. And that's why I brought up. He had, I had all this competition. And he says, I want to test you, Matt. How real is it? And it was real. I surrendered, and I just... Every day, on my knees, Lord, help me. And in 1993, I was an 83% kicker. In 1994, I was a 95% kicker. And in 1995, I was a 92% kicker. And I became that kicker that God had always planned for me to be because I had surrendered it all, not just some, but all of it to him. And I'm not going to promise you it will always go, you know, because it was still hard. I still had a lot of ups and downs in my career. But I will tell you, the freedom to fail was there. I could fail and know that I was loved, right, that I had a purpose and a cause that was greater than, than football was, and I, the, the freedom to be cut, the, the, that fear did not, you know, touch me anymore, Johnny. And you can l lean in on that too. Yeah, yeah you know, we're, we're – there's, there's so many men, there's so many – women, there's so many young athletes, whether they're professional, collegiate, high school, elementary, who's feeling that same pressure that he's talking about all over this country. I have the privilege to be able to speak to that. You have the privilege as parents, as coaches, as whatever role God has put you in, have the privilege to speak to that, to empower those young people to become who they're supposed to be. And that's, that's basically all that I want to say. Every now and then as a coach, I get the privilege of telling young athletes that they are free to play because their parents' love for them is not tied to whether or not they score that goal or miss that goal. And the love of the Father, the, the God of this universe, is not tied to whether or not they score that goal or miss that goal. So you're free. Have fun. Because God loves you. Sure. Doesn't matter what you're going through. Go ahead. Listen, it, it sounds easy. <laughs> Amen. 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 It, 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 it really does. It sounds easy, but it's not easy. You know, we get caught up in these bubbles, whatever those bubbles are. I call it the NFL bubble. Uh, other people, I mean, we, we call it whatever it is, but the truth is, is what Sean said. The challenge is, is what I said. It's easy. I mean, it's not easy until you make the decision to put Lord of your life, to be that man and woman of God who he's called you to be, and it could become easier and easier and easier. That's awesome. And we are over. So a mentor of mine who's in the room, Larry Moody, said, it's a process, and God's responsible for the results. One of the reasons why I wanted these two men on stage is they're in the process. Amen. They're up here speaking because they live this out all the time. So come up here if you want afterwards. I'm going to close out with prayer. If you want to talk with them more, it, whether it's today or tomorrow, use my phone numbers in that magazine. You can find me. I'll connect you with one of them or with one of our staff that can help you along the process 
of finding out more about what they've been talking about. Also, if you come up here, uh, Matt might let you wear my Super Bowl ring. Whatever. For just a few minutes. <laughs> no, no, I won't. Let me close this in prayer. <laughs> Father God, thank you so much for these men. Thank you for Miles. Thank you for Coach Garrick. Thank you for Mike. Thank you for Brandon. Thank you for everybody that was on this stage tonight. And thank you for everybody that's in this room. Uh, Father, we are all part of something that you're doing, whether we know it yet or not. Um, as Brian started the night out with, we are here for a reason. And Father, I just think about when I was young and I was invited somewhere and I didn't know what I was going there for. But I was going so that I could learn that you loved me so much that you sent your son to die for me so that I could be in an eternal relationship with you. Father, through that, you've empowered me to continue to take that truth to others. And I pray that you would give men and women, boys and girls in this room, the opportunity to do that on their teams. As they come alongside FCA or whatever ministry or, or just work on their own, create in their own way, Father, I just pray that you would give us a chance to lead every, and we mean every, coach and athlete into a growing relationship with you and your church. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. That's awesome. Good job. Thank you.